let's get into it. We got Jared Lucas, uh, guard for Oregon State on now. So Jared, thanks so much for coming on tonight. We'll start off with a question that we ask all our guests, and it's not basketball related, but it is a very important question. What is the best and worst meal you've eaten on the road as a college basketball player? Best meal um, was Prime 47 Steakhouse. I forgot where we were at uh, one of our road trips. I think we might have had it twice. Actually, we had it in Indianapolis, I think. Oh, nice. Uh, worst, you might have said, I was grateful to be in the uh, NCAA tournament, but you guys might have seen some of the meals. The worst meals were the two days we were in the – or the two days we were, like, locked up and couldn't get food from anywhere else. Oh, yeah. It was bad. I don't. I, I think it was like we got like a bread bag, uh, some chicken, and broccoli. Ooh, that's Yikes. Oh man! So they were not. They weren't treating you guys like royalty at first. <laughs> first they weren't, but I was fine with it because we we're in the NCAA tournament. But the food could have definitely been better. <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. So kind of talking about the NCAA tournament. Uh, Oregon State just comes off an amazing elite run, elite eight run. That was amazing to watch. Uh, and it really seemed like that your team really embraced that pick last storyline that we've heard a lot. How did that kind of motivate you guys throughout the season, especially going into the tournament? I uh, definitely motivating us early. I know a lot of us had seen um, the rankings and I, I'd say every, yeah, I'm going to say every poll I saw, we were 12. Um, and I had actually printed out a couple of those before the season. I had them, um, in my apartment out in Corvallis and it was motivation. And then eventually um, it just kind of started to be our thing. And then obviously we get to the NCAA tournament or a 12 seed. Um, so once I, I'm going to be honest, once I had seen that, I knew that yeah, it, it might've been, it might be our time because that number 12 seemed to be a lucky number for us. Kind of going off of that. Um, I hadn't really heard a ton about you guys when the season had first started uh, when the, when you guys were picked last in the Pac-12, was that something that was kind of like insulting, surprising, or was that something that like you were like, I disagree, but I understand? Like how, like what was your guys' kind of reaction when you saw that? Um, I wouldn't say, I, I'd say that I was a little surprised. I didn't think we'd be 12th. I understood that a lot of people, a lot of media, um, had seen that we lost uh, Trace Tinkle, Kyler Kelly, uh, obviously two big parts of our team. But also went to, uh, for like guys like me, um, Ethan Thompson, Zach Reichel, uh, Gianni Hunt, a couple of those other guys we had, kind of like disrespect, um, just because we knew what we had coming back. I understood yeah. we probably shouldn't have been in the top half in the preseason rankings. We knew how good we were, but to be projected last was uh, a, li a little, a little bit disrespectful, I guess you'd say. Um, but we knew we were going to use this motivation, and eventually led us to where we are to uh, where where we finished this season. Yeah. And uh, going off of that, um, was there, I mean, obviously you guys made the run. You guys were a good team. Um, was there a moment like during the season earlier than the Pac-12 tournament that you guys were like, okay, like maybe we are like, maybe this is something that definitely is possible, like making the NCAA tournament. Um, or is it just something where you guys just kept grinding and grinding and uh, things were producing? Uh, I'd, I'd have to say everything kind of clicked. We'd won three straight road games. Our, we were starting, we beat Stanford on the road. We beat Cal on the road for the first road sweep uh, in quite some time for Oregon State. Um, and then we went on to beat Utah. So three straight road wins. I, don't know, yeah, I think it was three straight wins. And then we had Oregon at home. We felt like we had a lot of momentum. Uh, but Oregon shot the ball really well. They went 15 for 25 from three. They knocked us off. But it was right after that road trip where we got Stanford and Cal, we said, Hey man, at this point, you know, we might as well make an NCAA tournament. And we just went downhill from there or uphill from there. Yeah. And what was really impressive to me in the, in the NCAA tournament, your three wins, um, was it seemed like you guys won in different ways um, in each game. Like obviously there were things that clicked all throughout the tournament, but against Tennessee, you guys were just on fire from three. Um, you went on some big runs against Oklahoma State and then kind of withstood their runs and then just locked down Loyola Chicago after they kicked the crap out of Illinois. So how did you guys adapt game to game? I think it's just like you mentioned. We had, I think it was six, out of those six games or six or seven games, we had six different uh, leading scorers. Um, so it was a bunch of different guys, different contributions. I know Johnny Hunt, one of those games, led us. Um, and then Roman Silva, uh, me, Ethan, Zach, Warth. 
Uh, I think Maurice Kalu won those games. And when you have guys like that, and I've realized, especially in college basketball, it really isn't one guy. As many people say, you know, it could just be one guy that leads you there. It really isn't because in college basketball, how many teams that scout uh, and stuff like that, you know, you're going to need different pieces. And that's what we had in the NCAA tournament as well as in the regular season. Kind of uh, talking a little bit more about that life inside the bubble besides the revolting food for the first day. Uh, I assume that it wasn't quite as enjoyable as Disney World like the uh, NBA players got. But what was it kind of like living there? And like, were you guys staying with a lot of the other teams that were in the tournament? Was it a public hotel? Like, was just the general public in there? How'd that like work with the COVID testing? Okay, yeah. Um, Well, we got tested every morning. uh, Well, every morning, um, depending on your game time. And then there were, at the beginning of the tournament, there were three or four hotels, but they were all connected. So in, in Indianapolis, uh, they had a bridge, like three different bridges that connected all the hotels, the convention center. So you never left. So like I said, three hotels from the start. And as everybody continued to win after the first weekend, uh, we stayed in our hotel. There are a couple hotel, a couple teams left with us. And then right after we won that Sweet 16 game, Every team that won that Sweet 16 game, all eight teams stayed in the same hotel. Um, so everybody was in one hotel. That The main hotel we were at, the JW Marriott, eventually opened up to the public. That was the one where the big NCAA tournament bracket was at. That's where we were at. That one opened to the public, and then all the NCAA tournament teams were in one hotel. So it kind of started with three hotels, 60, 68 teams, then eventually went down to one. So it was crazy. Right. And then it was like, wow, like, you know, here, here we are, obviously, at the end of the season, you know, we're, we're, well, I don't know, one and three, one and four, in fact, go play, and then here we are, Baylor and Gonzaga in the same hotel, so, you know, we're, we're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's really cool that, especially, like you said, with all the Pac-12 teams that made it to the Elite Eight, I mean, Oregon State, USC, UCLA, um, I mean, that's that's really cool. But I kind of want to know, too, a little bit, I was reading, I think it was on the Oregon Live that you guys got kicked out of your hotel room the night after you lost or the night of losing to Houston in the lead eight. What, what was that all about? Uh, I wouldn't say it was necessarily kicked out. I did see that same article, but um, it was kind of like we lost and then they had said, Hey, uh, I forgot it was midnight. I think it was one o'clock in the morning. We packed up <laughs> what time our game was. We packed up one o'clock in the morning on the bus plane ride uh like two o'clock in the morning and then obviously three hour time change and then you know where we're at we flew into eugene and then back to corvallis so we didn't go to sleep until like six o'clock in the morning yeah. oof that's brutal that sucks <laughs> that's brutal <laughs> mcdonald's uh, for dinner today too oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go <laughs> um Talking about the tournament still, uh, even though it was kind of a weird year for the tournament being there, like no fans, low fans, um, how was the uh, feeling? Was it still like a kind of a March Madness type feeling? Like overall, did it, do you feel like it would have felt different with fans? Like what were your kind of feelings on that? I definitely feel like it would have been a lot different uh, with fans, uh, knowing like, you know, a school like Oregon State. We hadn't done this in quite some time. I really feel like there would have been a lot of support, and I had noticed, um, you know, in previous years, you know, when teams come home after the first weekend, so basically making it to the Sweet 16, you come home for a week, um, and, and the love and support from all your fans, you know, driving back or driving to the next game would have probably been pretty crazy for us, and obviously not getting that experience. But being in the NCAA tournament was also a once-in-a-lifetime experience as well, being in, that, uh, in the bubble. So I made it, it also made it cool in, in that part. So you guys finished in the top 25, uh, 20th overall in the coaches poll. Uh, that being said, I don't know how you guys felt as a team, but personally, I thought that that was kind of a punch in the face because you ended up finishing behind Loyola Chicago. Into next year. Uh, it gave us motivation heading into next year, but also helped us realize, like, you know, probably could have been up there. But I also realized that early in the season, um, we weren't the team we are now. We had lost to Portland, Wyoming, and Washington State. 
you know, if you watch the video of that team, that Oregon State team and the Oregon State team we saw in March, it's two completely different teams. But losses like that, like Portland never didn't even win a game in the WCC. So that loss looked terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then Wyoming was bottom of the bottom of the pack of Mountain West. So I understood why we weren't right. where we could have been top ten or top fifteen, but also like uh, twentieth. I see why they why they put us there. Right, for sure. And kind of the next step, I guess, since you guys make the Elite Eight, win the Pac-12 tournament. What's kind of the next step here, like a uh, championship or bust next year, right? <laughs> Hey, you know, for us, uh, you know, all the, high, all, the, all the high expectations, we might as well. That's going to be our mindset, you know, championship or bust. You got to win one for and the Pacific you... Northwest. Uh, Oregon. We got to keep losing. <laughs> Oregon's one of uh, We'll do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll try doing it for Oregon State, I guess, because Oregon, Oregon's back to back, back to champs. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there you go. There you go. And are you uh, expecting any of – oh, sorry, go ahead, Drew. Oh, I was just going to say, and following – I mean, we're West Coast homers. I'll, I'll admit that. But oh, all, throughout the, all throughout the whole season, we would look at – I mean, the rankings at the end of the day don't mean anything. It's whoever actually plays the best. But all throughout the season, it seemed like just the whole conference as a whole was just getting disrespected. Like, I hate to bring up, like, obviously the rival Oregon, but, I mean, they were – at the top of the regular se- uh, top of the regular season standings, and they weren't even in the top twenty-five like at any point until the last week of the regular season. Um, a team outside of maybe USC or UCLA barely sniffs it, and then the conference goes on this amazing run in the tournament and proves that a lot of those teams were a lot better than most people around the country thought. So, what did that success in the tournament say about the conference? You think? Yeah, well, like you had mentioned, I think I remember looking at the polls every week, and we might have been lucky if we had one team. Um, and I was always shocked in that there's one, you know, there's multiple teams in our conference that everybody can look at now and say they should have been in the top 25 every single week. Um, and then, then you also got to look at teams like like UCLA made it to the Final Four. Um, they might have been ranked early in the season, um, but they weren't in there. But also, you know, with all these other teams like the Big Ten, they I think they got nine teams in. Um, obviously, Michigan is the lead eight. But if we get that same kind of respect in the AP polls, um, we get seven teams in. You know, and and for a team like us who finished um, fifth or tied for sixth, you know, we don't have to necessarily win the Pac-12 tournament to get in. You know, it would have been six or seven teams in there. Um, the next question I have this, uh, kind of twofold, um, was there a toughest player for you to guard in the pack 12 or, uh, just over the season in general? And was there a tougher, like, was there a toughest team to guard on the offensive end of the ball as well? Yeah. Um, defensively, I'm gonna have to go Remy Martin, uh, Remy Martin. Oh yeah. Definitely one of the toughest players ever had to guard. You know, a lot of people say that he might do too much or, you know, flops a lot. But that's what makes him so special and so hard to guard, his ability to draw fouls. A lot of times, a lot of guys, you know, you can put a hand in the passing lane, stand up in the air. For a guy like Remy Martin, you put your hand in there, he does the same Kobe thing where he gets in, he gets that foul call, every, you know, the little yeah. put, put his shooting motion into your arm and gets that foul. And he's so quick, quick release, and he has a green light. So with Coach Bobby Hurley, he'll take a shot from all over the floor. Um, and then toughest team, the guard was Colorado, and I know a lot of players in the Pac-12 that can say this because I've talked to a lot of them. Even going into that Pac-12 championship game, um, we knew that they were going to be tough to guard, and they're a veteran team. I think they started four seniors, one junior. Um, the rest, they had guys coming off the bench that were seniors, like studs. So I was surprised they didn't go farther in the tournament because they were really, really good. Yeah, man, and then transitioning a little bit, going back to your high school days um, at Los Altos and Hacienda Heights, um, you scored, let's see, I want to get this number exactly right because it's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you averaged 39.6 points your senior year. Um, you set the SoCal record for the scoring. Um, Jeez. <laughs> and I know you've talked in interviews before about, like, playing for your dad and how important that was for you in high school and how you – chose to do that instead of maybe going to a bigger private school where potentially you get some more national attention on the recruiting trail. But um, 
I mean, I joke with the guys that like, I know what that's like. Cause like I played for my dad in the YMCA, but just a little bit of a different level there. It's, it's, it's about the same, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. Why was staying at your uh, local high school and playing for your dad important to you? Um, for me, well, my dad went to my high school as well back 40, 50 years ago or however long he went. Um, he had went there and I'd always grown up in that gym and I had a group of friends uh, that I played with like third grade. Uh, they're all pretty much some of my best friends now that we'd all grown up together and, and everybody was like, hey, like, you know, this is, we're all going to do this. Um, and we ended up having a really special team, one of the better teams in Los Altos history. Um, but I, I honestly, you know, I had I had options to eventually go private or because private schools in Southern California are the best schools. Um, yeah. think about it, or every single one of them. Or, but I had my options, but I just couldn't pass up um, leaving my city and leaving the legacy out of Los Altos. Yeah, and uh, transitioning a little bit to your time uh, on the Compton Magic, um, for our listeners at home that don't know, they uh, it was uh, your AAU team uh, back in 2018. They went 46-2, uh, and two, uh, having some names like both of the Mobley brothers uh, from USC, Isaiah Hill, Johnny Juzing, and uh, Jalen Clark from UCLA. And then we weren't sure about the timing dip. Were you also on the team as well with Onyeka Okongwu? Yeah, yeah, he was on that team as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so having some some pretty big names on the team, um, what were some like memories you have from the AAU team and some of your favorite teammates from there? Oh well, that that team, like you mentioned, was really special. Uh, me and Johnny Juzang had actually played together ever since seventh grade. We played on the same oh uh, Earl Watson Elite team, and then from Earl Watson Elite. Both Johnny and I played on Compton Magic together. So we had been playing together for a while. I don't know since I was like 13. Then Isaiah Mobley and Evan Mobley. Um, Isaiah, me and him played together uh, on Compton Magic during the 15 year with Johnny Zuzang. And then Big O was on the 17. And then eventually we all played together. We all played up one year on the 17 year. And then we played together again on that same team. Mind you, that first year's team was me. Johnny Juzang, Big O, Isaiah Mobley, Evan Mobley, uh, Jules Bernard, and uh, Timmy Allen. So when you look back at that team, it was a really, really good team. And one of my best memories I have with those guys, probably after winning um, like the national championship, we were 46-2. and two. Me, Johnny Juzang, Big O, Evan Mobley, Isaiah Mobley, all went to Cabo uh, to celebrate. Um, so that was definitely one of my better memories. Did uh, Johnny Juzang have that ridiculous contested mid-range to long two-range shot that he was just nailing every single time against Gonzaga? That seemed like a 100% clip. At what point did he have that in his bag? Oh, his, his whole career. I, I'm pretty sure he hit one on me in the Pac-12 tournament. Me, he was chirping at me when he said it, too. Uh, <laughs> that was in overtime. In overtime, he hit one. <laughs> he, he's, he's always had that Johnny Juzang work ethic. He's, uh, amazing, and he and me and him always talk about it. Uh, really, just pushing each other because we knew that we were kind of competing for the same spot on Compton Magic. Eventually, we both were starting five, so we were competing against each other. So he pushed me to be better, and I'd like to think I pushed him to be better, even though he's going to be an NBA player, could be this year, or next year. Did you guys ever talk with each other about trying to get onto the same college team at all, or was that even realistic? Or no, it wasn't realistic. Not at all. Unless Johnny Juzang wanted to go lower, like that, lower, like the offers I had. Um, <laughs> I had pretty much every offer uh, in America, and then for me, like I only had one Pac-12 offer, to Oregon State. Um, so the option was up. <laughs> Johnny wants to go to Oregon State. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess Kentucky's a little bit more prestigious than Oregon State. Yeah, just, just a little bit, you know, a little bit above. Yeah, only one of those teams made the tournament, though. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, how did your relationship with Owen Simplis come about as come about as your trainer? How did you get connected and start working with him? I've been training with him since eighth grade. Um, I just went through one of our family friends, Johnny Hernandez. He was the one who kind of um, set us up, and then he kind of worked with Comp Magic a little bit. And I've been training with him, like I said, since eighth grade. I uh, just kind of worked, started working out uh, yesterday again with him. With all those NBA guys, uh, it, it's definitely made me better. I've been fortunate enough to know the people um, that I do to help me get to the level I'm at today. 
Yeah, and kind of going off of that, um, during quarantine, you were able to train with guys like Shea Gildas Alexander and Nikhil Alexander Walker. Um, and it's always spoken on how uh, there's a big step up it, from college to the NBA from the training level, um, just to start. Um, what was the diff- What were some of the differences in like the way that they train versus how you do at Oregon State? Uh, definitely their change of pace. I want to say that was something we had worked on, uh, change of pace. And then at the NBA level, uh, that change of pace is, is needed, and then especially at the college level. Um, especially Shea Gilders Alexander is the one guy I want to point out because the way he changes speed is crazy. You can see it in this NBA game today. A lot of times it looks like he's not even trying, but it's because he has that slow um, slow kind of slithery game where he's he can do anything. That's something I learned, you know, for the most part I've, Early on in my college career, everything's either a three or I'm putting my head down going to the basket. But training with those guys over the summer really helped me realize, like, no, you know, you can put a shot fake in your game. You know, you can slow down certain moves and then slow to fast. So, yeah. Yeah. How did, how did that uh, training period translate to you your play this year? Uh, it definitely helps. Uh, you know, my freshman year, you know, I averaged four a game. This year, you know, I kind of tri- – I tripled my scoring, averaging like some 12 a game. It helped because a lot of times, like I just mentioned, you know, it's just that change of pace. This yeah. college game is so fast. Um, but once you're able to control it um, and, and have that change of pace, it help, it really helped me in all those summer workouts. Playing with guys like that, uh, like Shea and Nikhil, who I pretty much – I'd compete with in one-on-ones. You know, I wouldn't necessarily win. Uh, too often, but I compete with them, so it, it helped me get the, the level I was at this season. Uh, kind of going off of that, you talk about learning uh, the change of pace from Shea. Um, what are uh, are there? Is it often that you learn moves from others to put in your own bag? And if so, uh, what are some of those moves that you've watched other people do that you're like, okay, I want to learn how to do this move. Uh, Peyton Pritchard. I, I love watching Peyton Pritchard mm. play. Um, yeah. He's something I really try modeling my game after. I trained with the – or I kind of worked out with him a little bit in the summer. Not worked out, but got a little open runs uh, in the summer over in Oregon. Um, he, he has this really good pound dribble. Uh, when, when it gets to the to both elbows, you know, quick pound, and then right up, rise up. And then Peyton, once he gets into the lane, he kind of has a really slow Euro step. That's really, really hard to guard. And those are two things I worked on this past year. And it's also something I'm going to really work on again to try to get in my bag. And kind of going off of that, when you're going into an off season, I hear you talk about those. Um, are you looking to uh, improve your game like on a in, in a way that's like specific to a skill such as like one-on-one defense Um shooting off the dribble? Or are you looking more to improve holistically, like, as a basketball player? No, no. For me, I always set goals. You know, there's always other little things I want to improve in my game. This year, it's um, defensively. Defensively, I improved a lot, but I want to be able to kind of not block guys, but do a better job of contesting. Um, and then offensively, my athleticism and finishing in the paint this year. Um, I made a lot of improvements this year. I'm really happy with the things I made. But for next year, um, there's probably going to be a lot more attention on me. So I got to be able to score in, in a variety of ways. This year, I struggled a little bit getting to the basket. So that's going to be something I'm going to work on. Yeah, Shay, you were saying And playing on that AAU team that had so many future NBA players and so many top tier college players. Was it hard to find, like, how was it finding your role on that team? And did that kind of help you move going into college when you started out your freshman year on the bench and weren't getting as much, obviously, playing time as you're used to in high school? Did that kind of, I guess, mold you and get you ready for college? Yeah, yeah, it definitely did. Um, you know, like you had mentioned, uh, early on in my freshman year, I, I didn't play very much. Um, eventually, I was able to get into the role that I wanted. But playing with the Compton Magic uh, – in high school, I scored a lot, and I played every minute of the game. And then going with Compton Magic, when you have five All-Americans on the floor, four or five All-Americans on the floor, I had to realize, wow, to stay up, to stay on the floor, I got to do this, 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 and this. Um, rather, in high school, I could have shot whenever I want and stayed on the floor the whole game. That helped translate to college because I realized, 
I'm not playing defense, I'm not going to stay in the game. Just like with Compton Magic, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to sit on the bench. And so eventually I learned early, um, a little later in my freshman year, to do that, I got to defend as well as shoot the ball to, at, a, at a higher clip, which I did at the end of the year in the freshman season. Uh, is your end goal the NBA? Yep, yep, that's the goal. Hope that I can get there next year. And then obviously, uh, if I can't get there the year after or this year, then, then the year after. But that, that's the goal. That's what I'm working towards this summer. Uh, what do you yeah, want to add to your game or improve about your game to get to that point? Uh, for me, it, it's really just going to be shooting the ball at a high percentage. I, I did a really good job shooting um, the three ball this year. But my field goal percentage from two was, was – I'd say it wasn't up to my standards and 38% from the field is not going to get me to the NBA. So I realized to do that, um, I got to take better shot selection, but also like I mentioned earlier, you know, finishing at the rim. I missed a lot of easy ones at the rim this year. I guess then does that translate kind of going into next year uh, with the potential of seniors being gone? Do you kind of see yourself as being the leader of the team next year then? Um, You know, I, I think I'm, in the, in the place to be a leader, but I know that it's not just going to happen. I got to prove that to my teammates. I got to prove that to my coaches. Um, but I do want to be the leader for this team. And I think I'm capable of doing it. All right. Uh, we like to transition um, kind of waiting down toward the end ish of the guys we have on. We like talking some of the more random, just basketball hoops talk questions. So I know you list on your Oregon State bio that Trey Young is your favorite, favorite player. Is that still hold up? Yeah, I'd say Trey Young or Payne Pritchard, either one of those two. And then who are some of your favorite players growing up? Uh, Steve Nash. I still like J.J. Redick. I've always been a fan of J.J. Redick. Mm -hmm. J.J. Redick, Steve Nash. I'm going to have to just go those two, honestly, because I was a really big fan of Steve Nash for a while. Uh, yeah, I still think I still have a jersey. I used to have a Steve Nash thing in my room. Yeah. So were you a, a Suns fan then, or did you have a, a team separate? No. See, I've, I've always been different, I guess I'd say. But my dad being a high school coach, I watched the NBA, but if there was an NBA, go NBA game on and a college game on, I'm turning the college game on 100% of the time. Oh, interesting. Wow. I'm, a little, I'm a little different like that. <laughs> my college teammates this all the time. Why are you watching this? I'm watching you know, a random game. Uh, some, you know, name two random teams. I'm watching that, you know, with the Lakers. Lakers and Celtics are playing. I'd rather watch the college game. Hello, I'm a little different. So you go and like watch like any cut any conference, like even if it was like non power five, like turn that on over <laughs> over the NBA. Yeah. You know, if if it's uh you know, I don't know, you name name a school, you know, it's the big west for somebody, you know, like maybe in the WCC or else, you know, a Laker game. I my preference I'm watching that that uh college game, Big West uh WCC game. Yeah, I like so that. Then, That's committed. <laughs> so then growing up, then who are some of your favorite mid majors to watch? Mid majors to watch. I'd have to go. Uh, UC Irvine was one of them because I, uh, well, Alex Young, who had played there, he was a really good player at UC Irvine. I think he's from Oregon. I think he's from Salem. Um, I, I liked watching UC Irvine. But, and then it was really Duke. Duke I liked watching a lot. And then when Lonzo Ball was at UCLA, um, I loved watching watching that. I think a lot of that people, team was fun. And then that Oregon team, that Oregon Tyler Dorsey team. Uh, that, that team was crazy too. Chris Bell, Peyton Pritchard was on that team. I might have been in high school. Yeah, I liked watching them too. Yeah, their final four run was crazy. Um, do you follow uh, the NBA Top Shots at all? No. Uh -uh. No. Do you know what it? Do you know what it's about? No. I've always wondered. I was going to ask that question. What is? What exactly is that? Okay. Oh, uh, baby. So basically, it's. <laughs> It's, yeah, here we go. Here we go. I can spend a half hour on this. Basically, basically, it's virtual, almost like playing cards. You'll have to look it up after this. But it's top plays from NBA players, and basically they get sold for money, and so people can trade them around. So depending, so it's basically worth a certain value. Um, so some of these cards are going for, well, cards, virtual cards are going for hundreds if not thousands of dollars depending on the value of it like a Kawhi Leonard slam dunk could go for what a thousand plus right guys yeah it's kind of insane like 
it feels very arbitrary how they set the prices. So now is it like, it's like a, it's like a like exclusive clip. Is that what it is? Kind, kind of. of. Kind of. I, it kind of. So all basically, I know is that uh, Luca Garza, Luca Garza just sold one of his for forty five thousand dollars. What? I seen you made a tweet about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, forty five thousand dollars he made off one. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to send you a link afterwards. But I guess what where I was going with that was if you had like two of your top plays from the NCAA tournament, like just two moments from the NCAA tournament. Which ones do you think would have been the worth the most? Because, like in my opinion, I think that your three against Loyola Chicago would be right up there, along with that crazy uh, layup that you had against Oklahoma State. Would those be your two, or do you have different ones? You got it. Those are my two right there. Yep, the Oklahoma State. Those are your two. <laughs> layup, and then the Loyola Chicago three, the dagger three. Yep, you got it. We'll have to see if we can get you at least twenty grand for one of those. <laughs> let's, let's get twenty grand for yeah. one. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. We'll match. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the NCAA will uh, maybe let some endorsing happen so you don't get in trouble. We don't get sanctioned for even talking about this. <laughs> yeah, the NCAA does have a lot of rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know uh, you're a bit of a smack talker, so I'm curious. Um, to what level do you like talking? So is there anything to you that's like, I guess you could say off limits or are you like a KG guy where you'll just say anything like the Kevin Garnett, he would just say like the most ridiculous stuff and he's probably the most notorious for it. So are you the type of guy that'll just say anything or, you, or do you have your limits? Uh, you know, my teammates will probably tell you I'm the type to uh, say say anything and everything. Uh, my freshman year, I probably didn't say a word. I, actually, I know I never said a word. Also, I wasn't in a place to say anything, you know, when you don't do, do too much in the game. Uh, and then this year, you kind of everybody kind of got to see the high school, Jared, uh, where I can talk a lot. I like um, that. <laughs> I don't go past certain things. But if I know something about somebody, it's going to be brought up in the game, especially at the free throw line. I tend to do my talking about the free throw line when somebody's getting ready to shoot a free throw. <laughs> do you have a, a favorite line that you've pulled on someone? Uh, well, one that happened most recently, I've told a couple of people about this. Uh, what was the kid's name? Anyways, one of the kids from Loyola, Chicago, the little point guard that was guarding me, um, he was kind of face guarding me all game. I had eight points that game when he was face guarding me, guarding me tired. I got in foul trouble in the first half. And then um, with that three, I knew what he was doing all game because, you know, a lot of times I get a lot of good looks off of Ethan's penetration. I'll be okay for a three. Um, so he face guarded me just like how I thought. Ethan drove left, I stopped, and I like faked like I was going left, went back right, three ball, we were up four, um, made that three to go up seven. Um, and then all I said was, but I, I was like, all I need is half a second and your season's over. Um, <laughs> Jeez. That, nice. That's crisp. That's crisp. <laughs> I had to clap for him when uh, the standing ovation happened when they were walking off, you know, finding giving their subs out. Uh, that, was, that was one of my funniest moments. <laughs> oh, man, that's good. For, that's a, that's a top sure, moment. For sure. And speaking of that clutch three, I'm curious to get your perspective on this as a D1 player. So we hear about these guys that just seem to have that clutch gene. It seems like, I mean, you've got it a little bit with um, obviously the huge three against Loyola Chicago. You hit that game when you're your freshman year in the Pac-12 tournament um, before COVID shut everything down. So in your perspective, I'm curious um, for a guy like yourself, for like those guys that are famous for it, Kobe, Damian Lillard, those guys that just hit clutch shot after clutch shot. Is that something that's inherent a little bit, or is that something that you think is born through the work and building the confidence through that? Uh, I definitely think it's born through the work. I, I tell a lot of people this, um, you know, to get to those moments, you have to put in thousands and thousands of reps. Um, and, and I do. And I, I think that it really is just kind of a testament of my hard work. I'm somebody that, um, really stays in the gym. I wouldn't compare myself to Kobe or Damian Lillard, but we were talking about their work ethic. I try to uh, exemplify their work ethic uh, when I step on the floor. Um, 
a completely random question, really. Uh, do you have a favorite like arena you've played in? Either it be AAU high school, college level. Um, is there been like one that's really stood out to you? Um. Well, first we're gonna go high school level. I'm gonna go uh, my high school at Los Altos. I tell a lot of people this. Uh, might sound cocky, but if anybody were to play me at Los Altos, I promise I'm shooting 50% for three. Uh, 50% for three and like 65% from the field, 100% for the line. That's how I feel about it. We got soft rims over there, uh, rims that, you know, if you hit the rim, it's going to bounce in. Um, and then in college, I'd have to go with T-Mobile Arena. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Knock on wood. Hopefully, you know, we don't have to bring this up next year, but, you know, I, I haven't I'm yet to lose there. My two years, so. That's Knock on wood. good point. It's a good point. All right, Jerry, well, one last question, then we're going to let you get going here. Three of Oregon State's players versus us three Y-ball starters. I mean, realistically, how many games are you guys winning against us? Uh, how many are we playing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not – I mean, I'm not – all of us are five foot eleven, so we do have the height. That's there, really but... generous, Kendall. I'm not five foot eleven <laughs> at all. Okay, one five ten. Uh, I, I'd have to say if we were to play ten. I might give y'all uh, like ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure, yeah, for sure. Uh, totally. It'd be generous to give us any. I was, I was gonna be like, wow, thank you, but no, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. I just, you I, don't I just want to start trash talking too against much. us. That's all I want to hear. Oh yeah, no, I probably yeah. say, I probably say ten out of ten if we were to play. Probably. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Dude, my favorite, my best trash talking line was against like some ten year old kid in Y ball. So. Yeah, I, I don't have confidence in this at all. Yeah. <laughs> I just I, – and I was, like, 16, and, like, I told this kid, like, sitting in the stands, he was 10 and I was six. It was really sad, dude. He was 10 and I was 16, and he was clowning me, and I hit a three, and I just turned and told him scoreboard, and that was, like, my peak. So, yeah, I think you guys got us. <laughs> it's out early, Drew. I like it. I like it. <laughs> All right. Well, Jared, thanks so much for coming on.